Welcome back to Mondays at the Museum. This is session three, the Metropolitan Museum of Art through the lens of social studies. Last week, we learned all about art, what kinds of questions we can ask ourselves when looking at art in the museum, and about two very different paintings about autumn by two very different artists, The Harvesters by Peter Bruegel, the elder, and Autumn Rhythm by Jackson Pollock. Today, we will look closer at how we can learn about history and cultures by looking at objects and works of art. We will learn how to ask questions like an archaeologist, learn what archaeology is and what an archaeologist does, and we will learn how to look closely at objects to learn about history and cultures. We'll learn how to look at historic paintings and the stories that they tell. So we're going to start by looking at and learning from objects or artifacts like archaeologists. But first, let's watch this video about what an archaeologist does. My name is Dr. Chloe Duckworth. I'm an archaeologist and I'm here to tell you about some of the cool things that archaeologists do. Now this is going to be one in a whole series of video blogs, so I really hope that if you have any questions about something I say today or about anything else to do with archaeology, that you'll leave it in the comments below. But for now, I'm all alone, so what I did is I went to Google and I had a little look to see the kind of questions that people often ask about archaeology. Let's look at some of those now. What is archaeology? Well, a lot of people will tell you that archaeology is digging up old stuff. Wow. And those people would be absolutely right. But there's so much more to it than just digging. In its fullest sense, archaeology is a way to try to understand how people lived and died in the past by using the material remains. Now, by material remains, we really mean anything you can touch. This could be buried remains, the remains of objects handed down from one generation to the next, or standing buildings. And in a lot of ways, archaeologists and historians have things in common because we're both trying to reconstruct the past. But we differ in the methods by which we do this. Let me give you an example. Let's say a thousand years from now, a historian was interested in your life. They might use documents, say an article from a local newspaper or a bit of a diary that you'd written in order to reconstruct events in your life. An archaeologist would be more interested in the material remains you left behind. Something like your toothbrush could tell us a whole lot about how people lived and hygiene in the 21st century. What does an archaeologist look like? What a fantastic question. I think the best way to answer this is just to show you some of my archaeologist friends in action. What does an archaeologist do? Well, as you've just seen, archaeologists do a whole range of different things in their jobs in order to reconstruct the past. We might be working in a laboratory, sitting in a cosy armchair, reading books and, and trying to contextualise our findings. We might be writing up our findings so we can share them with others. We could be teaching or giving a talk to the public. We could be in the field excavating. We could be in the field surveying, using state-of-the-art techniques to see beneath the ground without digging, or looking to see the wider landscape into which the site we're interested in fitted. We could be doing any of these things or more. But most archaeologists tend to specialise in one area or another. I'm hoping that in future video blogs, I can give you some insights into some of these different jobs. What's the coolest thing you've ever found? I didn't get this question from Google. It's a question that archaeologists get asked a lot, and for some reason we're really bad at answering it. Now, I don't think we're bad at answering it because we don't think we've found any cool stuff. 
I suspect it's more because we find it difficult to pin it down to one object. What most archaeologists are interested in is connections. We want to know the context of an object and how that tells us about the people who made, used and discarded it. Was it brought in from a long distance or was it made locally? Was it high status and expensive or was it a common everyday item? All of these things feed into our understanding of the past. Now, a treasure hunter is going to be interested in an object for its value, for what it can be sold on for. For this reason, they're usually more interested in expensive materials like gold. For the archaeologist, the value of the objects lies in what they tell us about other objects, about the people they were found with or the site they were found in. And for this reason, we're just as likely to get excited by a rubbish pit, a skeleton, even a coprolite, as we are by a gold brooch. Oh, really? All of these things are interesting in their own way because they tell us how people lived, what kind of work people might have done, what sort of things they ate and whether they led a violent life. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope that you'll tune in to future video blogs to find out more about archaeology. And don't forget, if you have any questions or comments, just leave them below. Bye bye. Oh, that was great. So before we go back to the Met, we're going to practice looking closely at objects before we explore the museum objects. So I'm going to do a special activity with you. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to expand this because this is going to be way more about you seeing what's in the picture. So remember, the archaeologist is learning about the people and the culture through the things and the materials that they find. So I'm going to take us through an everyday object that you probably have seen or have or are using right now. This. So the first thing I'm going to ask is, what is this? Well, it's clearly a cup. But how do I know it's a cup? I know it's a cup because, well, it's, it's got a hollow area in here and, and a solid bottom. So it could hold, it could hold anything from rocks to liquid. And I'm going to assume because it's made out of paper, but the paper has a special plasticky feel to it. So I'm going to think that maybe the plasticky thing allows there to be both cold and hot liquids inside of here. And I'm going to look really closely at this object. And I'm going to see if there are other things that I notice. So one thing I noticed is that there is a seam. Can you see the seam here? So this tells me that this was made out of something that might have been flat before and then was folded into a coffee cup mold. And that makes me wonder well, was it made by a single person or was this made by um, a machine? Is this something I could make at my house or would someone have had to do a lot of work to make this happen? Because it looks very clean. And it looks like lots of, lots of these have been made. This might not be the only one. And the way I know that is that there's numbers under here. These numbers have I'm going to take into, I'm going to think have to do with how many, what number this was and when it was made. There's a number here that says 2018, which makes me think it was made in 2018. What else am I looking at here? Oh, it shows me there's different choices maybe that, that, that might be inside of this cup. Makes me think that the people that use this probably have lots of choices that they can choose from, or that these are the types of things that go into the cup. And then I can look at this and wonder, hmm, what does this have to do with this? There's, I see a mermaid because I see some fins on the side and she has long hair like I've seen a mermaid before. And here's a crown on top of her head. 
I'm going to say that this is a very important symbol to the people that hold and use and made this cup. I can look back here and I know, oh, well, there's words here to help me understand. And because I read this language, I can read and see what it says. And it says that first sip feeling, let us add a little joy to your day. Hmm. Okay. Starbucks rewards. Interesting. So I'm going to say that they are really into sipping and sipping is something that I, that I do when I drink. So definitely a drink goes inside of here. And then there's another, some other pieces here. It's careful, the beverage you're about to enjoy is extremely hot. Well, there's another clue. It's hot liquids that go inside of here. Do not microwave. This cup is made with 10% post-consumer recycled fiber. It even gives me the material that it's made out of. Thanks. So there's a lot we can learn just by looking closely at everyday objects. So I'm going to take from this that this is something that's easy to throw away. It's probably not something that we're going to keep for a really long time because it is made out of paper, but it is sturdy enough to maybe use a few more times. So there's my object lesson. And you can do this with any object in your house. You can use it I could have gone through this too. It's a whole bunch of cool information, new material, and different things you can look at from um, and think about with, with the cultures that might use something like this. But you can use you can use a coffee cup, you can use a doll, you can use a lamp, you can use any object in your house, and just ask yourself a bunch of questions about what is this. Why was it made? Who made it? What was it made for? And what does this tell me about myself or the person who owns this or the people who made it, or the people who sell it or use it? So many questions in the world around us that we can look at one simple object and learn from. So now that we've kind of experienced asking questions, we're going to go to the Met and ask some questions about one of the pieces of historic uh, artifacts that they have in their collection. So I'm going to make myself small again, move myself out of the way, and we're going to go here. So look at this guy. Let's start asking questions like an archeologist. This is something that you could pause. This is a good time that we could pause and you could ask these questions as a class or with your grown up or just to yourself and write them down. But these are the questions of what is this? How is it made? So, you know, I don't know. This looks like it must've been something really big and, and really heavy because it looks like it's made out of stone and I'm going to say that it had to have been made, it could have been made, you know, a long, long time ago, and it could have been made, excuse me, um, just recently, because it looks so detailed. Look at all those details. If someone carved it, they used a lot of care and had a lot of skill to be able to do something like that. How is it used? Well, gosh, I don't know. Maybe it was used as like an entryway, like a gate, because sometimes I walk by houses and they have like two lions on the side. Maybe it's like one of those lions on the side of, of a house. And who used it? I wouldn't know. It's pretty big and pretty amazing. I'm going to say probably a king used it because I don't see that in front of houses that I live near. And what does this tell us about the person or people who made it? Hmm. Well, they were very detail oriented. They were very patient and very good at what they did. And they had something, maybe they had different uh, creatures than we do. Looks like this guy has wings and, and he looks like a cow. I don't know, he's a pretty strange guy. Let's go to Met and see what they have to say about it. Here we go. And this time we are going to go to the time machine. And this is so cool. I love the time machine. And we're going to go way back to 1000 BC, just like 3000 years ago. I'm gonna to go to the Middle East, because that's where this is from. I'm going to push this button. 
Okay, where is that guy? Oh, I think I saw him. There he is. Oh, human-headed winged lion. I was on to something. See what they have to say about him. Fun fact. Superheroes have been around for a long time. Wings were symbols of supernatural powers and creatures that had them were like superheroes. Cool. Human-headed winged lion is made out of gypsum alabaster. Hmm. It's from around 800 to 859 BC, which is about, gosh, 2,500 years ago. It was made in Iraq. And it can be made, it can be found in gallery 401. That means there's at least 401 galleries at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Now there's a video we can look at. We can also discover. So let's learn a little bit more about this. The ancient Assyrian, Assyrian ruler, King Ashurnasirpal, oh, that's cool, called these creatures beasts of the mountains and the seas. This beast stood at the gates of his palace guarding it from evil and showing off the king's importance to all who entered. The creature has five legs so that it looks like it stands firm when viewed from both the front and the side. Oh, that's interesting. You can find the different animals that make up the supernatural protector. What supernatural above or beyond what is natural relating to a god or deity? Hmm. What powers might each provide? Well, let's, let's look at that again. So he's got wings, so he has the power of flight. Um, looks like it's like a, a lion, I guess. So he's gotta be strong and fast. And, and the human head makes me think that, well, he's gotta be pretty smart, right? Let's see what they say in this video. Hi, I'm Kelly, and I'm here in the Ancient Near Eastern Art Gallery. I'm Kim Benzel, and I'm a curator in the Department of Ancient Near Eastern Art. Were there any superheroes in the ancient times? Oh, yes. Do you see those big guardian figures, the gateway figures? They're a mix of a bull, a bird, and a human. I see the human head. There are wings. And there are hoofs. What are these amazing creatures? Anything that's a combination of human and animal, or different types of animals in one figure, is supernatural. And they protect the palace. So they're actually doing the work of a superhero. The superhero in our world, it's a human with some sort of animal power, right? We name things that we think have power after animals, powerful animals, and very much the same ones. Really powerful sports cars. You have the Mustang or you have the Jaguar. So when you think of a superhero today, what comes to mind? I picture a person with a cape or some sort of special gear. So do you think you have any superpowers? Ice skating would be one because at first it's very hard, but you'll eventually learn good moves, jumps, spins, that will look professional when you compete and perform. When I watch like the Olympics and I watch really great skaters, to me they look like they fly. There's a little figure, he's the beginning, the idea of taking on the powers of the natural world. I noticed the bullhorns would make him look as if he were a god. The horned animals were thought to be powerful. I see the cape and a bird of prey's feather. He's trying to get the powers of that very powerful bird of prey. And then when we look at these big guardian figures, they have wings. This might be the first superhero. I think you might be right. This is Kelly reporting from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Good stretch. <laughs> wow.
Wow. Well, I think she was using her close looking and asking good questions. She was definitely looking closely at those pieces and finding maybe the very first superhero. So it's not just objects that tell us stories about the cultures and histories of the world. We can also learn about history through the many layered stories told in historic paintings. Let's go back to the map and move on up to the American wing and see what we can learn about a very famous river crossing by George Washington during the Revolutionary War and how the painting itself has a part in adding to the story. So we're going to go back here and move myself over here. Whew, so much to go through. Let's see if we can find the American wing. I know it's over here somewhere. Aha. Oh, and I think I see the painting. There it is. Washington crossing the Delaware. I'm going to click on that. And let's look at this. Wow. So I don't know about you guys, but I've seen this in my um I've seen this in a lot of my different history books all through time, but I've never seen the whole thing like that. That's a big painting. I think we're going to find out in the video just how big it is. So this is made by Emanuel Lutz. It's oil on canvas. It's made in 1851, quite a long time after the actual crossing of the Delaware. It was made in Dusseldorf, so it wasn't even made in North America. It wasn't even made in and along the Delaware, but it's in the American wing. Again, gallery 760, so many different galleries. In this one, we can watch, discover, imagine, and create. And this is a cool fun fact. This painting is the largest painting on canvas at the Met. It's as big as a small school bus. Pretty amazing. Onward, General George Washington leads his American revolutionary troops across the Delaware River in a surprise attack at dawn on December 25th, 1776, Christmas. Almost everyone and everything seems to be in motion here except Washington, who as the leader stands calmly on the boat looking ahead. Find these details, a flag waving, a foot kicking ice to the side, a horse on a boat, and reflections of people in the water. Oh, interesting. Let's see if we can do that. I'm going to try to make that a little bigger. Let's see if we find that waving flag. There's someone kicking the ice. Oh, look at all these details. This is quite a story. Look, everyone is moved. There's something going on with everyone. But look at George Washington. He's standing perfectly still. Cool. Let's go. Let's go back and watch the video, see what they have to say. Hi, my name is Carmelo. Hi, my name is Gaia. We are here, here to, to talk, talk to Betsy about Washington crossing the Delaware River. Hi, I'm Betsy Kornhauser, and I'm the curator of American painting here at the Met. So when I first came here, it was with my mom and her class. I was walking through the hallway, and I saw the enormous painting in the whole doorway. It was just, like, huge, and I was, like, so surprised. When I was in school, I had a book that had this painting. Since it was, like, a, a smaller book, I only got to see George Washington and then that guy who's wearing that brown heavy coat. I was very surprised, like I didn't even know it was that big because I thought it was just like a little picture. This painting is very often used in books on the American Revolution in which you were studying in school. Uh, when you try to reproduce it in a book, you can't begin to see all the detail the artist Emanuel Loitza wanted people to see. So I was wondering why did the painter paint the scene during early morning instead of during the night because they were crossing during the nighttime and they were hoping to do a surprise attack. The artist Emanuel Loitza, he likes to kind of play around with fact a little bit 
to make the painting as dramatic as he possibly could make it. So he decided to paint when they're almost across the river, which would have been early morning. And he was really interested in including that detail in the sky of the morning star. Washington is facing that and they're moving forward about to win the day. So you guys know how famous this painting has become, you know, over time. And it inspires artists to do responses. An African-American artist, Jacob Lawrence, did his own version of Washington crossing the Delaware, but he invokes African-American figures in the boat. I noticed the way it's painted, like an abstract way, like you said. Yeah, I noticed that there's no ice on the water. While the Lloyds of painting shows a single moment in time, Jacob Lawrence is showing generation of struggle of African-Americans who were brought to this country as slaves against their will. And we know there's one in the actual original painting. Behind Washington, you see another rower who is an African-American. He had been previously a slave. His name was Prince Whipple. And because of his heroic actions during the Revolutionary War, he gained his freedom. Other details represent the fact that all different types of Americans were fighting to gain independence. Thank you, Betsy, for telling us about the painting. Wow. Oh, that's great. So it looked like they were noticing closely as well and really finding out new things. There's a lot of new stuff in there that I learned. And I learned every time I look at paintings like that. So before we move on, we're going to take a quick pause. That'll be the, that's going to be our final visit to the Met today. And we'll come back next week and explore a little bit more about science. So let's close this here and let's take a quick pause. So again, this is a good time to chat with a grown up or to stop and think and reflect. And I'm going to read through it for you and you can follow along if you'd like. What is it again that archeologists do? How many archeologists do you think it took to dig up the human headed winged lion? Did you ever think of paintings telling a story before? If so, do you remember any of those stories? So my challenge for you this week is to be an archeologist. Walk around your house and look at all the objects you have. What if an archeologist from the future came and asked questions like this? What is this? How was it made? Why was it made? How was it used? Who used it? What does this tell us about the person or people who made it or used it? What conclusions might those future archeologists make? And here's my special challenge. If your grown up says, yes, this is a great chance to watch or rewatch your favorite Indiana Jones movies. Maybe you'll have a new appreciation for what Indy was doing in all those films. Thank you for coming. And I hope you had as good a time as I did this time learning about history through art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I'll see you next Monday at the museum. Bye.